What's good, farmers? My name is Antonio here, and uh, this is just a short clip out of the full um, podcast. Uh, I talked to Ferg for about a, an hour or so, and uh, I've already posted the full episode on my website. It's baby-investments.com. It's completely free, so no registration, no login, no nonsense. It, it's even ad-free, by the way, to watch an episodes on there. And sometimes I post the episodes before I publish them on YouTube. Uh, besides that, there's also some some other things on that website that you might or may not find helpful, like you know stuff like my watch list per industry. So we've got uh, uranium, oil, gold, silver, and copper. For now, though, I, I'm adding to it as we go. Uh, I also publish the things that I read and the things that I watch on the daily on that website. So you know stuff like articles and and, and news and, and podcasts and videos and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, it, it's just like, uh, I guess it's like the stock market would focus on commodities through the eyes of an inexperienced investor who is trying to learn as much as possible full time. Again, that's baby-investments.com. It is completely free. Now, let's watch this clip. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess the thesis makes sense so far to me. And um, <laughs> as you're talking about your portfolio, that also made me think that, for example, in, in my portfolio, in, in gold and silver, for example, there's... Um, you know, there's explorers, developers, there's producers, there's um, what else? Uh, royalties, and then you know, drillers and, and service companies, basically. And so oh. it, it is sort of universally believed, I guess, that um, like explorers can offer big percentual gains, but they're high risk. Then the, you've got near-term production companies; they're they're often said to be the best risk-reward ratios. Uh, producers are said to be the safest. And royalties, uh, people just love the royalty business model as they have, uh, you know, higher margins they're, and, and thus they're pretty safe, but they also have some nice upside. Uh, and then you've got drillers or service companies and, and they're an indirect play on, on gold and silver, I guess, as they, they, well, they essentially provide the shovels. And so I was wondering, what is the, the like the equivalent of all those, um, of all those companies or type of companies in the oil industry, Ferg? That's a, that's a big question. So we got the oil majors. Obviously, you've got all the, the big guys like Shell, Chevron, BP. Um, and they're the ones that, like kind of what I mentioned before, they're the ones that are really getting hammered with ESG. They're kind of hatching to divest of a lot of their assets. So I just, I'm ignoring them really. They, I don't think they any longer provide much value. Then under them, you can really split, um, you can split oil extraction kind of um, the few ways you've obviously got um, the Middle East which isn't really particularly investable you've got all um, Saudi Aramco and um, but yeah the the main sort of extractions you've got is uh, obviously shale which I'm just not a fan of at the moment I think it's got sort of further pain as people um, there are some good companies but yeah I still think it's got a bit too much sort of optimism baked into it got oil sands which um which are, some of them look great, but my one that um, I am most interested in is the offshore space, and that's um, sort of like w with oil rigs um, out to sea. And that was also the one that kind of got the most punished over the last year. So that just had an absolute brutal time. It, it had a brutal time from 2014, and with a lot of the, the, the just um, having been overbuilt and having far too many rigs around the world. So they've, they've just had a sort of a, um, a thinning of, uh, you know, just, just supply demand, too much supply. So it's um, had to come down a lot and resulted in a lot of them going bankrupt. So you've had Cedril, you've had Noble, you've had Valaris, um, all go bankrupt last year and all start to emerge this year. And that's what I like to see is where you see sort of acute pain in a sector. And so that's kind of what drew me to that, especially when I um, started to see how some of them were coming out of um, their restructuring. So just eliminating all their debt, really cleaning up the balance sheet, being quite lean and mean. And so, yeah, I focused on that sector a lot. Also focused on the service stocks, so oil service stocks that, um, that are, have also been absolutely brutally punished. And um, yet some of them, I think, are very oversold um i don't really do much in the exploration side i just don't think there's much need to take that risk of um as i've got more confident now i've started to sort of see if i'm missing something with some small companies especially ones that are in sort of non-esg compliant uh 
countries. So I'm, I've got a list that I'm sorting for at the moment to try and find. Like well, once I get really bullish on a ferry, then I start looking for the really illiquid small stocks that I think are just completely mispriced, and that's kind of the last um, topping up the portfolio. But the way that I've found that I get the most sort of the most asymmetry or payoff is there's some very cheap options on some of the offshore and the oil service um, names, and so I've loaded up quite heavily on them. So yeah, that, that's sort of a, a top to bottom. Oh, the other one with oil majors is you can obviously separate the the sort of western oil majors and the the eastern oil majors because they aren't um, they aren't having the ESG pressure, so they are still investing in in capex development exploration, and so they're a lot more attractive than their their sort of um, US and EU peers. That's a that was indeed a big question. I uh, didn't expect mm. it to be that big, <laughs> but um, <laughs> why, why I asked you is that is because as I said, I'm, I'm working on building a framework since I'm, I told you off mic, I'm looking to make oil a significant part of that training demo portfolio of mine. So, um, um, and yeah, I guess a, a twofold question here is, first of all, do you believe that oil should be approached by building a framework or should I focus on individual companies first? And then if you do believe that, I should approach it as a framework. Maybe you could sort of nudge me in the right direction on how I would how I would like to diversify between those type of companies that you just mentioned. Yes, yeah, so well, a framework is essentially is where the way I always approach it is how can I minimize my risk while sort of retaining as much upside as possible. And so, it's, oh no, oh. sorry, someone's at the Don't door. Worry about that. Yeah, the dog's been a good guy, dog. Yeah, so it's how can you. How can you sort of achieve as much upside while sort of protecting against the downside? And so that's always the sort of approach I come in at. Where it's also why I like to comb through the most hated sectors because often that's where um, just the sheer sort of the sheer um, rate at which they despise is why they you get just a far larger margin for safety. And um, that's essentially what's happened in offshore. Is just take Take Valaris for example. They um, they they've reemerged at two billion. Might, might be a bit more now. They um, they did have seven billion of debt going into um, the restructuring. That's all been eliminated. The um, the debt holders have now become the equity holders in a sort of debt for equity swap. You look back, the sort of replacement cost of all their rigs and floaters are um, somewhere around fifteen to sixteen billion, and um, They've still got a half decent backlog, so you've just got a really de-risked asset. Like I, I like to use the analogy of it; it just helps people understand that it is like it's like a taxi company. So if you if you decided you wanted to start a taxi company, you'd go out and so maybe maybe buy a few hundred taxis. You'd have to obviously incur the loan to buy all those taxis. So just say for a round number, you incur a loan of um, no, like a. 10 million to buy all your taxis. Now you've got to go out and um, compete with um, all the other taxi companies and the debt servicing makes up a big part of your overhead. So if you're $10 million loan, you've probably got, say, 5%, 500 grand that you are servicing um, that you've got to make on top of what all your taxis bring in to, to make the whole business work. And so what's happened with these is like, to sort of expand the analogy, I guess COVID came along and go into quarantine, everyone stops using taxis. Um, they have to go into chapter 11. They, um, you wipe out that, um, that $10 million loan now and you pop out the side and now you've still got all your, your assets and you've removed that whole debt servicing. And now anyone that comes into the taxi industry, maybe you've expanded your market share um, out the back of it like some of them have, like Noble, um, Noble were offshore driller, like it acquired another um, Pacific drilling and out the back end of um, it, to, um, emerging from, from chapter 11. And so what you've got is you've got a very competitive, uh, like a moat essentially, like a competitive advantage because now any taxi company that tries to compete with you, they have to take on the loan. They've got that higher fixed cost. You can underprice them and if you see a whole lot of like people coming out of quarantine, want to go to a whole lot of festivals and, and um, there's going to be a lot of demand for your taxis, then you can make an awful lot on the sort of Uber style surge pricing. And so that's kind of a way to think about how I kind of look at the, 
the offshore sector is there is they have really sort of got a um a huge competitive advantage and no one's going to be able to compete with them and the cost that they have their assets and um and they stand to benefit massively when the the oil majors realize that they that they need to um they need to ramp ramp production with 45 odd percent of their um their proven reserves that we've offshore and um and they're going to be able to start using the surge pricing that's a that's a great example i love it uh you know mm. it seems like you've been thinking about this for a while now uh so uh mm. yeah awesome taxis i like Sorry, it a lot the dog was just running around attacking people in the background so i was trying to keep my train of thought <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great example. I appreciate it. Uh, makes a lot of sense. I love examples as they, you know, they help me think. Um, so, yeah, out of those companies that, that you mentioned, what, what would you say then to, what would you expect to be the best performers? Because you said you're staying out of exploration. And mm-hmm. would you expect still exploration companies to, although the risk, would you expect them to outperform in, in the long term? Or what type of company do you expect to be the best performer? Yeah, so it depends what you're wanting to achieve. So like the likes of Luke Oil, Gazprom, like you're going to get a very good, steady result. So higher dividends, um, more sort of a pension. Like it's what I'm always careful is I'm always speaking from my perspective and that I'm, I'm 35. I'm pretty aggressive with how I want to grow my portfolio. I'm very confident with how this thesis is going to play out over the next sort of five years. And so I'm always um, further out the risk spectrum, but someone that wants something with less volatility than, yeah, probably the, some of the, the big Russian names, probably safer, still the, um, still the restructured um, offshore names, uh, a, a very good sort of risk reward. And, um, but yeah, if you want to go further out the sort of risk spectrum there than some of the, um, some of the oil service and, um, some of the just yeah, the smaller names there. Like I've been looking at a few lately. Like a one that's really nice is like MMA Offshore, um, Tidewater. I've mentioned that was a that restructured back in 2017. So that's a similar story to sort of Valaris, and you've also got the sort of auxiliary like a one that I like at the moment is CGG. It's like a geophysical mapping. So it's if I see a future where we obviously need more oil than their services which have um haven't been required at all for the last few years then they'll come come back in a in a large way mm-hmm. and there's also long-term options on a lot of these like like on cgg they have sort of um, the european markets have have longer option markets so i think you can get um out to out to the end of next year on cypm you can get out to the end of 2023 so that's how i'm kind of that's that's kind of the the way i'm gearing my portfolio there there is also the argument that you just buy the um the oil futures just because of that backwardation that i was talking about that you get gearing by just betting on the straight commodity but i like to sort of get my double bounce on the tramp by buying a something like cypen which is very geared to oil and then i buy an option on top of that which like doubles the gearing as well so if i'm right i'm like really really right yeah 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 then okay yeah that makes sense uh, I, I was thinking though when i i wrote it down as you spoke um i didn't hear you i didn't hear you mention oil tankers earlier but i do know that you own some of, of uh some oil tanker stocks yourself if i remember correctly from my from our last conversation so um do you consider those those stocks on on indirect or maybe a direct play on on rising oil demand as well so I've actually divested, I've sold off um, all my oil tankers. So I just wasn't happy with what I was seeing there with their, their sort of discipline. They were, um, they were increasing their sort of orders. They weren't scrapping enough. And it was when I really looked at the thesis, they just had made a decent amount of money last year at the same time that offshore was going through, going through bankruptcies. So and it makes sense that they're not sort of feeling the acute um, sort of pain that the offshore, offshore sector is. So I've actually rolled a lot of, um, I've rolled all of my tanker positions into offshore and oil services. And so that's been sort of a change I've made over the last six months. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, that's good. Um, you said at the beginning, you said that you like more of a, of a concentrated approach. Um, yeah. How many oil stocks do you own? Um, probably less than 10. Yeah. Less than 10. Okay. Mm, yeah, that's maybe, interesting. Yeah, maybe seven or eight, I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Um, well, so no, it gives me, you know, it helps me sort of start thinking about my own framework. Do you include uh, Russian companies in there? So I haven't at the moment. I, it's not because I'm adverse to them at all. Like I would probably put um, put Luke Oil um, Gazprom in there, but I'm just looking for really, really sort of maximum um, sort of capital gains, like upside exposure. And so those those would be if I had sort of a um, if it was more of a sort of a pension portfolio that I just didn't um, didn't want to take um, too much risk and really just wanted to have um, a more like the dividends are great. I think, I think they really are the replacement for some of the oil majors now, but um, yeah, I've, I've just got, I've got kind of a barbell approach now with the restructured companies I named. Um, I really like Saipem and I've really, really been quite heavy handed with the Saipem 2000, uh, December 2023 options. So I just think they're completely mispriced. So I've um, yeah really built a really large position in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. I, I like how you said that maybe the Russian companies can be the replacement for majors because when I'm mm -hmm. when I'm building a framework, I would like to you know sort of build it per tier, and I I would like to have the majors in there. But what you just told me, and what I've experienced over here in 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 Europe is like I don't want to include Shell, I don't want to include BP, I just don't want to have these companies. But I would need a replacement, and that makes a lot of sense. So that's yeah. what about what about exiting strategy? That's something that I've also written down. Like, how, how do you plan? I, I think you just told me three to five years, but how, how do you plan on exiting? And and yeah, maybe when? Um, so this is always my um, my whole sort of philosophy is that you just got to scale out gradually, and you scale out as you start to see sort of extreme bullishness start to come through. You start to take um, start to take pieces off the table. So. With the, with the oil trade, um, it would be when we're starting to see sort of crazy prices in oil to start with, like would probably be um, oil rallying well past 100, 150 even, would start to um, start to take some money off the table. Because I know with, it's always important to point out with what I'm doing isn't investing. It's kind of more trading. And I know these are inherently crappy companies. They'll have a window of profitability and then they'll go be go back to being crappy companies like offshore is a terrible business it's just very leveraged to a particular point in time so i don't want to own these companies for any longer than they're sort of this initial ramp up from them being undervalued to making a ton of money as soon as that starts flowing through then i'll be scaling out of them and so that's that's just understanding that they're highly cyclical um yeah, so like just the behavioral side is just, um, yeah, once people start talking about it, there's lots of analysts on it, it starts making its way all over CNN and BBC and you, um, everyone starts wanting to talk about um, what energy stock is the, um, is like on Kramer and all those sort of things is just will be gradually scaling out and sort of reducing exposure in that way. Um, just seen the, the supply side really improve, like seeing um, seeing the actual, like with my sort of numbers that I think we require, if I sort of see that sort of supply start coming on, like big discoveries, um, like if you see that pipeline really start improving, then um, yeah, that's that will start to sort of negate the thesis at a certain point. I don't want to be around there. Um, I don't want to sort of be involved once it's... Um, once it's got past a certain sort of level of fundamentals, kind of like I, I wrote, a, wrote an article on it, which is called the monkey trap for uranium. And that's just the idea that once you see, um, once you see incentive pricing um, go well past um, where I think it needs to be sort of in the sixties, then, um, and once you see spot shoot past term, then that's sort of 10% off. Once you see um, the number of companies like just, the obviously number of exploration companies will just explode. So like uranium is an easy one to 
it was at 500 down to 50 and it'll probably be up to sort of a few hundred by the end of the cycle the same will happen with oil everyone will be exploring for oil and telling stories so um yeah it's just it's been very aware of the sort of the john templeton quote of like you kind of um you don't want to be hanging around in the euphoria phase and it's um we've got to see that like i always loved using this sort of the late 2017 with crypto when you really got to see euphoria and so it's just understanding that whole behavioral side is um as you start approaching that you just really need to be taking more and more off the table i, I probably intend to write it try and write it right to the top but it will be with probably 10 percent of my um my original position mm-hmm. yeah so that's that's probably i haven't actually got a clean exit strategy for oil yet because i just still see it being so far out but i should probably start working on it <laughs> yeah i listened to uh listen to a podcast i guess or was it a video and somebody said that the best time to enter and the best time to to you know uh go home from a party exit a party basically is when the first beer bottle hits the wall i, I cannot remember mm-hmm. who said that i would like to give them credit because it was a great saying and the same goes for for the markets right uh, you should be looking to to by the time you hear the sirens is already too late as uh, as, yeah. as the offspring said so uh it's um you know constantly looking for that first beer bottle that that hits the wall i guess that i guess that also goes for uranium it's a sensitive mm-hmm. sector as well so uh yeah that's a good point well uh ferg i uh, i've had a good time i uh, went through all, all the questions that i needed to sort of written down some stuff as well to sort of build my own thesis and see if i can build a framework around it so uh yeah that's yeah. about it for me did, did you want to add something at the end here 